We are going to move on to how has the governmental coup affected the Israeli economy. And I am honored to invite Professor Yaakov Frankel, former governor of the Bank of Israel, laureate of the 2002 Israel Prize in Economics. Professor Fr Frankel, please. And I am also honored to invite Shlomo Dovrat, co-founder and general partner at Viola Ventures, chairman of the Aaron Economic Policy Institute at the Reichman University. Yes, yes, you may applaud, ladies and gentlemen. Let's not be stingy on applause. The applause are the most important thing in this conference, so you can continue to applaud. And the uh, session is moderated, and uh, uh, the moderator and participant in this uh, panel is Professor Tzvi Eckstein, Dean of Tiomkin School of Economics, head of the Aaron Economic Policy Institute at Reichman University, former Deputy Governor of the Bank of Israel. Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon. We don't have a lot of time. The effect of the government overall on the Israeli economy. Let's start, first of all, with talking about the world. Where is the world at? Where is Israel at in context of this crisis? And then we'll talk about where the Israeli economy succeeded in the past five to 10 years, and what are the projections made by economists as a result of the change in, I would call it, in the judiciary in Israel as it is currently proposed, even if it isn't happening. And ultimately, we will conclude with presenting the impact on uh, the field of high tech, especially by Shlomo Dovrat. The first speaker is Professor Yaakov Frankel. He's already been introduced. Jan Kale, please. Thank you, thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here. I remember uh, the first Herzliya conference, and a lot of things have happened uh, since then. A lot of things have happened to this university, to this conference, have happened to the State of Israel, and have happened in the world. The opening sentence at the beginning of Major General Amos Gilad's comments, he explained to us that we are at a situation of a strategic early warning. And I asked myself, strategic early warning in which field? And the fact that this is a strategic early warning, that means that it pertains to many areas, many fields that interact with each other. And what we're going to discuss today is the economic element. And I have to say that this is indeed a first-rate strategic early warning. And one cannot exaggerate on this topic. We can talk about a budget and the way the budget uh, is being conducted and the review Reversal of affairs, usually a budget uh, is decided on after defining the goals. And then you ask yourselves which tools to adopt in order to achieve these goals. And also, uh, it, uh, you specify how to monitor this. But here, it's the other way around. First, they take, and then they think. But I'm not going to talk about the budget. Uh, we'll leave that to something else I'd like to talk about the uh, governmental overhaul, the regime overhaul. Initially, it was presented as a judiciary reform. And the more we got into the details, we saw that it's not exactly a reform. It's not exactly judiciary, but it's actually a governmental coup, a government regime overall that changes all areas of life, not just in the details, but also in the uh, conduct and management. And those of you who were here this morning in Professor Rafi Melny's fascinating talk, 
heard an overview on how the world has changed and how the Israeli economy fits into uh, these uh, changes in the world. And indeed, we're talking about a completely different world. Had we been talking here today, as we did talk 10, five, uh, 10 years ago, five years ago, a year ago, the overview we would have given would have been a completely different overview. And what this means is that the world has changed. And this time, it changed dramatically because it uh, moved from one crisis to another and the first crisis erupted before the second crisis erupted before the first one ended and now we find ourselves in a situation of an interaction between all these crises and Rafi called it the great financial crisis that the financial world experienced in 2008, 2009, 2010, and the world started to slowly phase out of it. It phased out of the crisis, but not from the insights provided by the crisis and not the great liquidity injected into the system in order to contend with that crisis. And as we just came out of that crisis, and when I say we, I refer to the world, we faced yet another crisis, the pandemic. And the pandemic crisis once again introduced a lot of uncertainty. We came out of it much more quickly than expected, much faster than expected, not because we, the economic way we dealt uh, with it was so exceptional, but rather the medical way we dealt with it, you know, the uh, uh, vaccines, etc. And then it started to recover the world, and came the war, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and that uh, had uh, impact and effect on China, the problem with the chips and the supply chain and freight and the food problem and the wheat issue, etc., etc., and this turned it into a global crisis. And we entered that system, and we managed to recover from that as well. And then the world, as the world was recovering and uh, coming back to its twist, and the IMF uh, published its projections for the world last week, and we saw that there is no crisis in the world economically. There is no uh, financial crisis in the world. What we do have is a certain drop in growth, a certain recovery, a certain uh, bouncing back. Next year will be better, and then we, here in Israel, out of the blue, since the beginning of the year, we've decided that things are just too good. I have never seen, uh, I would say in human history, but let's say in our history, in Israeli history, there was never a situation in which there was such tremendous destruction of value in over such a short period of time by such a small group with such focused influence without sufficient discussion. And we are still in the middle of this event. And I ask, and everybody knows, everybody knows, how we can get out of this. So I'm going to fast forward to the end. How do you get out of a problem? You try to go back to square zero. But what did we get? What we got is a certain delay or suspension. You'll soon ask me, what are you, a politician? Why are you speaking like a politician? You know what? Let's put a semicolon and let's open parentheses. And I'd like to introduce myself to all of you. I am not a political figure. It's true that I was presented as a former governor of the back in Israel. I was appointed by a very right-wing government by Prime Minister Shamir, just, you know, for the purpose of historic justice. I'm telling you this. And then I continued and worked with Itzhak Rabin. After him, I worked with Shimon Peres. And after him, I was appointed for the second time, this time by Benjamin Netanyahu. And then I uh, served with, I worked with Ehud Barak. I worked with Ariel Sharon and with Ehud Olmert, none of them ever asked me, not even once, did you vote for me? What are your political views? Because the currency for success at that time, and they were very, very different individuals from all sides of the political spectrum, right and left. And the main goal was a financial, a financial success. And the independence of the Bank of Israel was the jewel of this crown. And all of a sudden today, whatever you say immediately classifies you. You're right wing, left wing. You're a Zionist. You're not a Zionist. And I'd like to go back to the opening sentence of Uri El Reichman, and it was repeated by many of the other speakers after that. This is a university that is proud of being a Zionist university, and there's no shame in saying I'm not a, I'm not a 
affiliated with any party, but I'm truly fearful of what's going to happen to this country and what's happening in this current situation. So people outside had asked me, what's the connection between these things? I mean, how come something that's happening in the corridors of the Knesset with this overhaul or judiciary reform, why is that connected to the economy? And I understand that uh, it's nice to be a liberal Democrat, but uh, what does it have to do with the economy? But it has a lot to do with the economy. And the reason it has a lot to do with the economy is that those who want to invest in it think that it matters. And that's enough for me. And it's not that they're being completely irrational. They say, I I want to know that my property rights are guaranteed, that my civil and uh, individual rights are guaranteed, that the values of the regime I'm investing in are similar to the values of the regime I live in. I want a liberal democracy before I go to my investment committee and ask them to invest. Moreover, I also want to have a correct uh, economic data and correct economic data that is all about the stability of prices, the stability of institutions, etc. And the fact is, without getting into details, that those economies that have decided knowingly or unknowingly to withdraw from being a liberal democracy uh, and leaned towards a, and went in a bad direction, their economic financial performance was severely uh, harmed hit. And it's not a question of statistics. It's a, a matter of people, uh, the poverty level, the image of these countries, uh, the attractiveness, how many people, if people are allowed to leave these countries. This is what we saw. This is what exists. And uh, suffice it if we look at Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Argentina. I remember that I was in Argentina on the day that the president decided that he wants to take over the Central Bureau of Statistics, the CBS. No one uh, it never occurred to us that anyone would think about doing it in a proper country, in a civilized country like ours. So the point is that the integrity of the data, the credibility of the system, the horizon of the policymakers, a lack of doubts regarding their agenda, knowing that everybody's uh, operating towards a common goal and solidarity, it, all that is uh, economics, is the economy. That's all you need in the economy. And we have uh, excess exceptional luck, exceptional fortune. I mean, we know what happened in Poland and Hungary. We have this ability to look into the future, to see what the future holds in store for us. The playbook is written. You know exactly what happens after stage one, after stage two, and stage three. You don't need to uh, imagine what would happen because they already did it. So what is this arrogance to ignore the advice of all the professionals from all sectors only in order to carry out this strange agenda. Look, I don't want to be uh, to go too much to the extreme. Let me just say that the key word that was repeated throughout this conference in every session was risk management. Risk management, uh, different kinds of risk management, even if you think that there is a certain improvement in certain proposals. If you're not sure, you must always ask yourselves, and what if? In this case, the what if is all about a completely different world. And how do I know? Because it's happening since the beginning of the year, since the this baby was born in sin. Investments in Israel have dropped. The interest in opening uh, bank accounts overseas by Israelis has gone up. Uh, the investment plans in Israel uh, are diminishing. And I know that we have here somebody who has started and manages a very large investment fund. Those who come to us stop by the fence and are saying, I want to wait and see what's going to happen. The Israeli institutional investors, instead of investing in Israel, are saying, I want to invest or we want to invest overseas. It's already happening. Uh, how is it possible that they're all fools? And if they are fools, it doesn't matter because this is what they're doing. So I'm saying unequivocally, we mustn't take this risk and therefore we mustn't, you know, uh, go for the jackpot. and. Uh, they're telling me, but the rating agencies that looked at us, they did not lower the rating. 
Somebody said not yet. They haven't lowered it yet. Well, I have two things to say. I and some of uh, the economists were criticized. Uh, they said, because you said that there is a risk, you know, uh, these are self-fulfilling expectations or these expectations justify your, themselves, and you've created the problem. I wish that were true, because then it, then it would have been easy to correct that. You know, when the weatherman says, you know, it's going to be uh, hot tomorrow, you can tell him, why don't you lower the temperature, and then it won't be too hot. When you put signposts on the road, put it uh, after the junction, and not before the junction. That's the rationale. But they say, yes, but you have special data, and you tell them, you divulge to them this great secret. In the world of internet, in the modern world, in the world of social media platforms, no data is private or privileged or classified. There's the credibility of those who use that data. And I'd like to say, please, don't try to hide and uh, take this problem head on. Now, the uh, credit agencies did write reports. Some of these reports were translated in Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew press in one way or another. But I recommend that you read the original, the English. And the English wording says, first of all, the Moody's rating agency that was supposed to increase our rating, they said, we're not going to take it up. And the other rating agency, SNP, they said, at this point, we're not going to change the rating. Why? Because we want to give you an opportunity to fix, to rectify. And we'll see what's going to happen. There are going to be votes on the budget. We'll see how that'll go. We'll see how they will deal with the goal. And now they indicate that I need to soon finish. So I'll finish. And I'll conclude with one word. For many years, throughout the 1990s or since 1985 until the year 2000, we had to deal with the inflation rate in Israel, and it wasn't easy. Ultimately, the inflation went down to a level of uh, stable prices, and that's a very fragile baby, and, and inflation has recently gone up, and I think that the Bank of Israel is doing wisely uh, that it is addressing this, and the governor of the Bank of Israel, it's good that they, he doesn't let uh, the, uh, any anyone scare him or threaten him, and those who set this fire, who started this fire, I think it's best they lower the flames of this fire and not fall into the paradox that you say, next to every fire I see the uh, fire engine department, so I'll accuse it. Now I'll uh, finish and I'll take my seat. And if anybody asks me what uh, needs to be done, because there is a certain suspension already, it turns out a suspension isn't enough. Cancellation. And if anybody thinks that we'll be able to lift this cloud without canceling the whole thing, revoking the whole plan, then uh, you're naive. Somebody might say, yes, but I don't have the political power to do so. I'm sorry. If you have the political power to introduce this, you must have the political uh, power to take it out. If not, other powers will take it out. Thank you very much. Well. I'm also the head of the Aaron Institute, which deals with economic policy, and it works with the government, with all governments, in order to promote growth in Israel and reduce poverty. Yet it's very important to mention we follow the data that the macroeconomic situation in Israel at the end of 2022 is better than any uh, projections, early projections, even our own institutes. And uh, we came out of COVID exceptionally well, and the Israeli economy is immune to a uh, shock just like Stanley Fisher would say. For six years until the end of 2022, it had realistic growth of 4.2%, 2.3% growth per capita. Uh, we hardly saw a decade similar to that. GDP per, per capita, with all the problems of cost of living, reduced the gap in recent decade from leading countries in Europe, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, the Netherlands, which are the benchmark countries for us at the Aaron Institute, from 30% to 20%. 
And that includes the COVID period and also periods without governments. Maybe that's actually the reason. In the past two years, there's been a massive drop in the uh, debt to GDP ratio. We've uh, bounced back to where we were before the COVID crisis, the most dramatic drop in all OECD countries. There is a significant surplus in the balance of payments, thanks to high tech and gas, a very responsible monetary policy. Yesterday's decision is responsible, serious professional. The Bank of Israel is leading the Israeli economy to reduce inflation, just like leading uh, countries in the world to a level of 2%. The financial system, with all of its problems, it is uh, stable. And uh, even during shocks, it can give credit to the economy. We're not a highly leveraged economy. Levels of employment in Israel are highest in Israel's history. Unemployment rate is at an all-time low. We have a serious problem with the employment of ultra-Orthodox Jewish men, low employment rates of Arab women, and an increase of a lack of occupations of young Arab men and women. It's important to emphasize that unlike previous years, the gist of this growth, 4.2 percent, is a result of an increase in productivity. The uh, difference, the gap from leading countries has been uh, reduced by 10 percent in a product uh, for, per one hour of work of an Israeli employee. And of course, and uh, there's the high-tech industry, which is our locomotive age engine. 40 percent of our growth comes from high-tech. It's 70 percent of the GDP. The productivity in high-tech is double of the average Israeli productivity, and it is increased in the number of employees by 6.6 percent over the past six years, 50 percent of a contribution to export and more than 50 percent of direct tax. In addition, there is a fantastic increase. It's projecting high tech onto other industries. For example, the finances industry, banks and financial institutions, their productivity per one hour of work has gone up uh, by 13.5 percent in the past 15 years. And uh, the increase in productivity comes from a significant increase in people with what we call high-tech occupations. That means they have a training similar to the people who work in the high-tech industry within the finance industry, and that begins to project on the entire Israeli economy. And by the way, the previous government came up with a plan to increase the number of people with high-tech professions, and surprisingly or unsurprisingly, this government adopted this in the 2022 uh, budgets and uh, you don't hear about in the press because there aren't any disputes on that. Following what Frankel said, what is the impact of uh, the reform and why do we as economists talk about it? It's pretty obvious that a significant drop in investment in high tech as a result of the global crisis might uh, be heightened and I guess are heightened as a result of the local political uncertainty since investments come, and Shlomo will elaborate on that, uh, are very much concerned with property rights. The high-tech industry is a key industry in the Israeli economy and in the world is based on institutions that are very sensitive uh, to the rating agencies as well. And they are in a dilemma, the rating agencies. They were supposed to up our rating in 2022. The fact that they didn't up the rating, that's already a negative result of what's happening here. And based on this special structure, we did an assessment at the Aaron Institute um, regarding the impact of the global crisis, as well as the impact of the uncertainty that's a result of the uh, governmental coup. So this uncertainty, if it will continue, it already has an impact. And Shlomo Dovrat, the head of the Institute, will explain. And I'll give you the positive scenario. The positive scenario for the uh, next three years tells us that as a result of what we currently see, the Israeli economy will grow on average by 1.5 percent. That's one percent less than what's expected for this year by the central bank and the Ministry of Finance. And we assess that if we continue with this regime uncertainty and if the coup, if the program will be uh, applied as it was worded, it will lead to a reduction in investments and will shrink the high-tech industry uh, by 7 percent over the next three years. And I'll leave it up to others to tell you what it might do uh, further down the road, given the situation in high-tech. 
the GDP per capita will go down. And that's pretty similar to the big crisis we had during the Second Intifada. The Bank of Israel also had some very similar estimates based on the data of a drop in growth of a ba between 2.5 to 1.5 percent. In the Ministry of Finance, the uh, paper of the chief economist is based on the global research mentioned by Professor Frankel by a, dro of a drop of 0.8 percent per capita. And that's dramatic. That means every percent GDP per, per capita is 17 billion shekels that we lose. And in the IDI and the Aron Institute, uh, we've written a new paper that will be published next week. And it talks about long-term implications when we're talking about this scale and magnitude. The economists are emphasizing the importance uh, regarding the relation between regime stability and uh, stability in property rights and the impact this has on investments, education, and on health care. And therefore, it's obvious that there's tremendous importance to strengthening the institutions, as we've heard from the rating agencies and all the economists who recognize that. One word about the budget. This is the worst budget we've had in the past 20 years, especially because there aren't any growth supporting and poverty reducing reforms. And many of the items it does include will expand poverty in Israel especially in the ultra-Orthodox uh, sector. Let me say this generally. The only bright uh, spot is that $500 million for the Arab sector uh, decided on by the previous government is included, and there is no encouragement of construction for housing, no tackling of the cost of living issue. Let me conclude. The Israeli economy is still at a very strong point if we manage not to suspend, but to completely uh, wipe out and uh, get rid of the coalition's initiative, if we will listen to each other, then we will be able to overcome this and perhaps even grow at rates that are similar to our growth rates until the end of 2022. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Speaking after such, two such respectable professors, first thing is there's no time left. And also, it's a bit hard to move on. But uh, if you will, still, I will say something. No, undoubtedly, the core of the economical success of Israel, but also, more than that, the, econo the core of the prestige and, and status of Israel during the past few years in the core is the phenomenal success or this miracle called the high tech, the Israeli has the high tech industry. Uh, with your permission, I would like to start on the bottom line and after that uh, giving you some context. Um, in the bottom line, they keep talking about strategic deterrence. It's an alarm. It's not an alarm. It's something that is happening. Uh, if uh, This is a uh, defense uh, conference, so I can tell you the damage is already made. The, the it, fence is already collapsed. Investments has been pulled out. And I am in, I have a very important job here regarding investments from all of the world, and these investments have already been stopped during the first quarter. The high-tech investments in Israel dropped 75 percent compared to last year when the uh, high-tech industry over uh, globally dropped in 50 percent, and it's now we expect to drop 10 percent. Again, compared to before, a 90% drop, the damage is already happening. This is not an alarm based on what might happen in the future, but rather a reflection of what has already started happening, which is why I want to put this discussion on a more urgent perspective than rather than a theoretical discussion, if you will, a few words about this miracle called the Israeli high-tech industry. What started at the 80s as a number of Israelis, uh, dear people such as Dov Fuman and others, who came back to Israel and started starting, founding here outsourcing or a development and uh, uh, development and uh, centers for Intel and, and IBM, Microsoft, and such international companies. It continued during the 90s with what was the beginning of what we now call the startup, the startup nation into a preliminary miracle. We've seen startups growing here, and uh, multi-international companies have been buying them and then investing in them more and more. This is the second phase of the high-tech industry, but the greatest success, in fact, started maybe it was 2000, maybe we can say after 2007 with the beginning of the innovation era called social mobile cloud, with the entry of the invention of the iPhone and
and the social networks were invented, and the, I cl the cloud, the computing cloud, uh, afforded us a dramatic change of dramatic companies that were able to sell their products and reach a market digitally. But more importantly, the Israeli entrepreneurs moved on to uh, moved on through a maturing stage where that I now call scale application. Israel is now growing high tech companies. We personally are involved with four companies that started from net zero and now they are worth more than $1 billion in income. These are numbers we couldn't have dreamed of several years ago. 85% of the greatest companies in Israel, the headquarters are in Israel. They are companies who do sales, management, financials. Everything is here in Israel. Only about 50% of Wix, for example, are tech workers. And today when we take this category, the greatest employer in the Israeli high tech of these growth uh, startup companies in Israel, over 50% of their employees are not technological employees. The economic impact in of the startup of the high tech in Israel for the for is so much greater than abroad, and the impact of innovation is now going into the rest of the economy in Israel. I uh, used an image in one of the our own institute uh, conference aid an engine a train engine carrying uh, older ones behind it carrying them, and this uh, slide was uh, adopted later adopted by Karnit and the friends of Bank of Israel afterwards as the thing that is very reflective to the Israeli economy. Happily. I can tell you, and it is maybe one of the greatest opportunities, as Tzvika said before, regarding the financial sector, that this innovation starts uh, getting to the rest of the Israel economy. And I think the potential is amazing, is extraordinary. But unfortunately, and I am a, a very optimistic person, or else I wouldn't stay in Haidek for 40 years. Unfortunately, we are under existential threat now on the Haidek industry. Uh, Industry. It's not theoretical. It's an existing present threat that we are seeing in front of our, our eyes. When you see hundreds of thousands of Israeli young people in Israel, and I've been active for dozens of years now in the in the social arena, it was hard for me to even get the high tech people to be interested in Israel. And now I see tens of thousands of young people in the streets. Most of them come from high tech, from the high tech industry. Some of the most successful entrepreneurs from Israeli high tech during the past few months are doing nothing, almost nothing, but be taking part in the protest. Why? because they see the work of their lives being ruined in front of their eyes, and I'm truly trying not to be too dramatic. Um, I would like to try and explain to you why it is happening. There is, in the Israeli high tech and its success, there is there are four significant elements. The first and maybe most important one is the entrepreneurs. At the end of the day, unlike other industries, you have the energy industry, textile industry, retailing industry, etc. These are uh, such industries we have uh, managers and people, etc. The high tech industry is based on a very small number of brilliant entrepreneurs. Yesterday, I took part in the funeral of Zohar Zisafel. He was a great man. Thanks to him, we have the communication uh, industry in Israel. If Gil Shved doesn't doesn't start the 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 high tech, doesn't continue the high tech industry in Israel, it will not happen. So the dependency of the high tech industry on entrepreneurs take several dozens of entrepreneurs from Israel and you will no longer have a high tech industry here. We can't do anything about it. This is not a, an industry of masses, of great numbers, of normal economical model. The, the, that very same, these very same people who think outside the box, who have the, cura the courage, who almost the, the unachievable desire to change the world. These are the people at the very core of this industry. And the second element is the manpower. And, and surely in Israel, we have more engineers per capita than in anywhere else in the world. Undoubtedly, the, our ability to uh, increase the number of uh, actions that were taken during the past uh, 20 years or to double or triple the the amount of students studying mathematics. We've seen the a very significant increase in the Israeli high tech for years, in fact, have been uh, limited in its ability to grow because we don't have enough engineers and enough people. And Zvik already mentioned the uh, current budget and the message it is giving us regarding our ability to increase more and more the manpower. And the third and not less important element is our accessibility to national markets. And the 
the fourth element is the foreign investors. 92% of the money in 2021, almost $30 million were invested in Israel. 92 or 93% came from foreign investors. We don't have local investors, Israeli investors, and of course not in those same volumes. The ones who promoted this industry are foreign investors. They didn't come here because they're Zionists. They came here because there's amazing, extraordinary innovativeness here, and they saw an ability to an amazing growth and inventions. And those in foreign investors are now on the fence and are very much concerned with the ability, their ability to continue on investing in Israel. If Israel loses its legitimacy as a state that is liberal, democratic, with judiciary that is working, functioning, with entrepreneurs who want to keep living in, those great investors will not be here. But I want to add one more thing that is very important. There is a context here, and the context is the international crisis. And I know it was mentioned a lot, and still I am less optimistic than what Jakob Frankel, Professor Frankel here, he quoted the IMF. And we are now in a global economic crisis. There is a drawback of a, a, a globalization. We have the China-US problems. We have a true a real inflation and high interest that are all creating a yield of known risk, uh, much higher than during the past 20 years, where the interest was less than a percent. But one more specific thing is happening in the technology world. world. This technological tsunami that we've all felt that started in 2007 with the iPhone and the cloud and the social networks that we've seen an investment of 1.5 trillion dollars in the world for those platforms such as Google Apple etc and we've seen a gigantic companies like Uber and Google etc being founded and this innovation cycle is start starting to plateau to drop and we've seen it slow down unrelated to the judiciary overall unrelated to Israel we see it globally we have a newer innovation cycle it's called AI and it's going to be I believe the greatest and most significant one much more than internet it much more than everything we've seen up to this day. But th within this transition and all the history is showing that when we moved from cellular to internet to social mobile cloud, in each such transition, we've seen a crisis in the industry because the platforms are unclear, the financial models, the business model are unclear. AI is not mature yet. It's very interesting. It's very promising. The state of Israel has been able to move through each, every each one of these transitions. And we are now at a point where the amount of money coming into the high-tech world is decreasing significantly. And we must compete with the best centers in the world all today want to develop the high-tech industry. And this time, exactly, Israel of all times is starting this attack of all the institutions of the state of Israel. And I must tell you, it's not only the judiciary overall, it's attacks we've seen of the military, of the Bank of Israel, of the, uh, the CBS, etc. There is something much more basic that feels that it is threatening the nature, the very basic nature of Israel, and the result is very clear especially from so endowment and sovereign world fund, those capitals that for, are so important for these transitions, such investors from the Emirates, from Singapore, etc., have completely stopped their investments into Israel, even now. Get your house in order. This is the phrase we've been hearing. Even now, as we speak, it's not an alarm about the future. I'm reflecting to you the present. And at this time of all times, and in this context of all contexts, I want to believe, and I'm telling you that on, based on many conversations with the other side as well, there are a lot of unintended consequences here. I don't think that anyone who started here, the judiciary overall, did it because of, I think they did it for political needs, for ideology, it's for emotionality, and other things such as this. They didn't mean to create a dictatorship or ruin of the economy, but it is the result. And I left after many years, I didn't speak out in the media and I decided to appear on the media and uh, all of the high tech industry is today in a, f a sensation of urgency, great urgency, because time passing is meaningful. We don't need a slowdown or a pause or dialogue. We need a solution and a great part of the solution would require us all to think very hard of what kind of state we want to live in. When I hear young people saying it, nothing would help because of demography, no, I don't accept that. There are a lot of ultra-Orthodox and religious people 
and right-wing people who feel exactly as we do regarding what is now happening. And we cannot think that the, that the liberal democracy belongs to only part, one part of the population. It belongs to all of us. And I still believe in the Israeli spirit, and I believe that we will be able to win and overcome. Thank you.